Um, I'm here with uh, my colleague Ollie. So we are um, doing a, a handover around about the middle of this presentation. But uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, biosolids recovery. Most of you in the room probably have no idea what biosolids are and the recovery uh, of those. But in terms of um, a picture, uh, it gives you an idea here. Uh, um, biosolids are the byproduct of wastewater treatment. One of the byproducts when, when wastewater is treated at a treatment plant, you get clean water and you get a sludge product which is treated uh, in, in this case by further anaerobic digestion and then uh, dewatered to produce a sludge uh, biosolid cake. Uh, um, it's not the most talked about end of the business, it's not the prettiest end of the business, but it does produce a very uh, um, uh, good and uh, popular organic fertilizer for farmers. It's not popular with large retail brands because of the emotive aspects of, of the product, but um, in countries like the UK with 60 million people, um, you produce quite a lot of uh, byproduct from the wastewater treatment and it needs to be managed. Uh, the EPA in Ireland and in fact also in most of Western Europe um, recognise that recovery of this product to land uh, as a fertiliser and as a soil improver is, is the best uh, and uh, most economic and most environmentally friendly way of recovering the product. Uh, uh, in a farm with continual tillage uh, where you're taking off straw and taking off grain every year, you're depleting the soil of organic matter and so if you just keep putting chemical fertilizers uh, on it without any organic matter, you don't uh, uh, maintain the, the goodness of the soil. So it's a very popular product, particularly with large arable farmers in, uh, in England where Severn Trent is. Severn Trent, the, 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 the client that we have, is um, it's, it's a combination of the two rivers, the Severn and the Trent. It's got a catchment of about 10 million people. It's about 4.2 million uh, households. So to put that in perspective, it's about three times the size of uh, the Republic of Ireland, and it's one uh, water authority. In Ireland, we've got Irish water coming in, uh, so Irish water would be a similar but slightly smaller uh, uh, water authority um, uh, than Severn Trent. It's, I think it's the second largest in, in England and Wales. So they produce 700,000 tonnes of this product uh, uh, annually from 38 uh, large uh, production centres. Um, and that's all recovered to land as a fertiliser and a soil improver. And uh, just to put it in perspective, the, the, there's 34,000 hectares of arable land that's required uh, in terms of the fertiliser value of this product, and that, that's across 4,000 farms, and there's a significant number of individual fields. <coughs> now, in 2010, Severn Trent Water uh, faced some issues. The practice of recovering this product to land is highly regulated, um, you have to continually assess the product that's being produced, the fertilizer product for pathogens and for heavy metals. It has to be continually monitored and uh, every field must be tested for suitability to receive the fertilizer product and every ton that then is recovered to those fields must be planned in terms of a nutrient management plan for the field and tracked and recorded. So every single load, every single ton must be tracked and recorded and there's continually evolving reporting requirements governed by the EA, which is the UK equivalent of the EPA. It's the Environment Agency in the UK. Um, and farmers are starting across England now to pay for this <coughs> product to be uh, um, supplied and spread to their fields because they see the value in it. And uh, the, there's, there's a requirement for the company to record that and manage it somehow in terms of invoicing farmers and, and, uh, and capturing that revenue stream. They had an old mainframe record keeping system which was, uh, in 2010, it was one of those classic old uh, black screen, uh, green font, mainframe systems and it simply wasn't keeping pace. So the, 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 the mainframe system was being run but it was surrounded by a whole host of smaller Excel type recording systems and um, systems within the, the, the biosolids team in Severn Trent and it was, it was an issue and uh, it was also going to be decommissioned. So that's when they, uh, they tendered for work and um, uh, Clear Power and Compass um, provided a, uh, a, a solution which was actually a little bit different to uh, what the other vendors were bidding in on. And we proposed to uh, use 
the existing Microsoft and SQL Server technology that they had, um, rather than a separate standalone GIS recording system that a lot of the other um, water companies in the UK would have. And uh, the, the combination of ClearPower's experience in the biosolids recovery, uh, the actual uh, front end work, and Compass's uh, um, excellence in the .NET world and the, uh, the GIS world uh, allowed us to propose a solution that was significantly different than the competition and um, a, a distributed system across their 38 centers and also to allow access over the web for um, uh, the, the contractors involved in the land spreading activity. Um, you see here the picture shows the, basically the, the communication requirement between the, um, the, the, the internal team and the environment agency and then out in the field in terms of contractors. Benefits of this, um, we've done phase one. Ollie's going to talk a bit more detail about that. We've replaced the mainframe system and we've delivered quite significant administration cost savings. Um, and we're starting now to look at operational efficiencies in terms of saving costs in the field. And we've allowed them to capture the invoicing to the farmers and link that back in with a SAP system uh, for the, um, the accounts. And the major, I suppose, benefit is that they now feel more comfortably compliant with the EA requirements and they can do ad hoc reports whenever they want. They can pull various different reports on, on, the, on the, uh, the activity. So uh, I suppose it's a story of how we move from mainframe into a distributed .NET, uh, effectively web-based application um, to deliver something very specific. And you can see uh, and Ollie's going to talk about it in a bit more detail now, how, how GIS uh, comes into play. And now, hand over to, to Ollie. Thanks very much. Hello, thanks a lot, Simon. Um, so, uh, the first phase, I think, for Seven Trent Water, it could probably be, I suppose it might be a bit of a horror movie, really, probably Escape from the Mainframe or something they would call it, but over the last year, we um, managed to release them from their, their mainframe woes, and they're now running on a, on a new web-based .NET system that we developed for them. So, I suppose for us as a company, um, much more of a GIS side we work on, we're now moving into the, the more interesting phase where we can start to empower the user, the users. I mean, at the moment, at the land bank that they're managing, um, you can see, um, it's not shown on the screen, but they have about 20,000 square kilometers of fields. They have about 10,000 active fields that they've put biosolids to land over the last um, three to four years, and they probably manage about 3,000 fields a year to spread biosolids, and that's all managed by three people. So as you can imagine, they're fairly busy people at the moment, and they currently do that task using absolutely no GIS, no spatial information. So everything they do is based at looking at paper maps or Google Maps at maximum and they have no ability to mine their data. So one of the major factors we're proposing and we're developing for them in their next phase of the development is the use of GIS. And like we've seen here, is this is the nitrate vulnerable zones for the UK, as you can see that um, a lot of the middle of the screen here is their land, so they have a major nitrate vulnerable zone that they have to manage. So. One of the major things with GIS is the ability for them to um, easily identify problem areas. Um, for each field that they look at, they have to look at over 35 factors, some spatial, some not spatial. You can't sludge to land if the land is too wet, if it's near boreholes, if it's in nitrate vulnerable zones, if the metal additions are too high. There's a whole bunch of factors they have to work on. So at the moment, for every single field, someone has to go and individually visit that field, fill in a, fill in a paper form, and then go back and enter that into a system, which is a very laborious process. And we're hoping to speed up as part of the um, phase two of the project. So some of those factors are nitrate vulnerable zones. These are um, areas which are identified by the EA in the UK and you, can't, you can only spread certain amounts of nitrogen to land. Also aquifer zones are areas where there's water that's extracted for um, human consumption. Then things like sites of special interest, people don't really appreciate you going, putting biosolids on um, monuments and things. It has been done in the past, but people get in a lot of trouble for doing it. And then again, there's lots more things, so natural occurring um, chemicals, um, spring boreholes, overhead power lines. You'd be amazed at um, where you can and can't, cannot spread. 
So one of the major things we've just started working with them is, um, as part of the business case for this, we started looking at the metal additions for any land that you spread biosolids on, it contains a certain amount of metals and there's certain limits for the amount of biosolids that can be spread. Um, and they do soil samples at certain, li uh, certain times during the, um, the stages of um, recycling to land. So we started looking at the GIS for this, and um, at the moment we're just using our desktop, but we're going to provide them with a um, browser-based solution so it can be accessed by the whole of Seven Trent Water. So we can see here that um, anything that's green and highlighted is good. I tried to find some um, signs of failure within the, the current data we have, but unfortunately there isn't many fields that fail on metals, so they're very good at managing their land at the moment. So if we go through, we can see all the different types of metals, and this is percentage to the maximum limit that can be delivered. So these fields are actually quite good for all of the heavy metals that they have to check. On the field pH side, you can see we're slowly going from uh, to orange, so there's no reds, unfortunately. But um, so it means that all the, these fields here would be good to spread on. So um, one of the major problems they've had as well is that um, they do sampling. Is um, it's not the farmer that pays for sampling of land to work out metal additions. It's Seven Trent Water that have to pay for it. And in the middle of um, the UK, there's actually whole belts of land that fail samples just by naturally occurring metals. Um, and they've had problems in the past of they've gone and sampled these areas and then maybe come back five years later and resampled them and discovered both times they failed. And these, um, it's, we're not talking kind of tens of thousands, we're talking hundreds of thousands that have spent sampling massive amounts of land to check for um, heavy metals and they've gone back and done that again where if they had a map to see this data um, they could have avoided spending that money so there is a big cost saving benefit to empowering the users just simply by providing them with a map to look at so I mean that's the basic level that I've talked about I mean once we start moving forwards with this the GIS analysis that can be done and the data mining that can be done on the non-spatial data but now we have field boundaries and everything that can be linked up is, is quite interesting. One of the major other things we do is, um, is we work with the regulatory side. So at the moment, um, Seven Trent Water, every bit of biosolids to land is either weighed or logged through um, a logging system on the treatment sites. So the next thing we're going to be doing is linking up the loggers that are on the sites to the biosolids management system. So for every single tonne of biosolids that goes to land, we um, can manage that and ensure that there's no um, biosolids delivered to the wrong field because it's quite a problem in the past where pe um, contractors have gone and taken 20 tonnes of sludge. Um, basically, when you see a big truck da driving down the road and you get a funny smell, it's probably because it's got biosolids in it. Um, those trucks have been known to go to land and build stockpiles of maybe a thousand tonnes of biosolids to then realise they've put it in the wrong place and they've delivered it to the wrong farmer. So it's quite a costly process to go and take that um, biosolids and bring it back to a treatment works and deliver it other places. So the bios, um, bio system is going to be used to much more regulate that system and ensure that biosolids isn't taken to the wrong places. So the communication between the bio system and the delivery systems on the treatment works is going to be implemented. So every single ton of biosolids that goes to land is fully documented and can be reported to the EA through the reporting procedures that have to be provided any, every year. So only authorised deliveries will be taken to land. And hopefully this will provide a reduction in the costly misdelivery of biosolids.